All right, well, good morning. My name is Kyle. I'm one of the pastors here. And, uh, you know, it's funny. Growing up, my, my mom used to tell me that I should be a lawyer. And one of the reasons for that was not because of intellect or anything like that, but it had to do with arguing. I love to argue or debate with people and get into discussions about different topics. And there's often times when I'm having a discussion and the person that I'm talking to just doesn't quite get it. And I think to myself, if you could just understand this one thing, if you just understood this one piece of information, it would click. And uh, we, we go back and forth and just trying to convince them of, of one thing. And as soon as they understand this thing, uh, everything that I'm saying makes sense. Now, maybe I'm wrong in, in the thing that I want them to believe, uh, but I'm sure a lot of you could relate to that, right? You're in a discussion with somebody. It might not even be a debate, but it's like, if, if this person can understand what I'm saying, everything will begin to make sense. And when we come to the Gospel of Mark, I see particularly in so far in the first chapter that Mark has something he wants us to get. There's something he's saying that's really important. He's saying, if you get this, it will click for you. You'll, you'll understand what I'm trying to say. And so what we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks has been the kingship of Christ, right? We've talked about Jesus being king. And Mark really wants us to understand that Jesus is king. He is king. He comes out and explicitly says it in verse 15 when Jesus says that the, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom is in your presence. The kingdom is in your face, essentially, is what Jesus is saying in himself, but Mark, uh, he, he wants us to understand that Jesus is indeed the king, but he's not just any king. He is the, the, the new king of Israel. He is the one who comes after King David, that everlasting throne that was promised uh, to David in the Davidic covenant, that Jesus is the fulfillment of that. He is the greater David. So as we go through this passage this morning, we're going to be in Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. And throughout this, let's remember that Jesus is king. And we're going to look at this and we'll see how Mark is trying to help us understand how closely related Jesus is to David and how King David in the Bible uh, helps us understand who Jesus is uh, in this passage. All right, so look with me at Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. I'll read it and it says this, and end they went to, into Capernaum. This is Jesus and the four disciples he had just called, Simon, which is Peter, John, James, and Andrew. The four of them go into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. So as we begin, we'll look first at the king's authority in verses 21 and 22. We see that Jesus comes into the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he teaches as one with authority. So imagine Jesus just called his disciples saying, you will be fishers of men. And they, they leave everything. They repent of what they were doing. They believe in Jesus as the king and they follow him. And it says they immediately on the Sabbath went into the synagogue in Capernaum. Now the synagogue is basically um, a structure that's set up that's kind of a, an offshoot of the temple in Jerusalem. So it was a, it was a Jewish house of worship where the, you would go to hear teachings, and you would go to debate and read from the, the law or from the prophets, and they would discuss the scriptures. The scribes and the Pharisees would come together on the Sabbath to do these things, to worship God, to sing the Psalms. So this is where Jesus went on the Sabbath. He goes into the synagogue, and he begins to teach. 
So as, as Jesus enters in, we, we see that him coming into the midst of, of people who, who know the Scriptures, people who are well-versed in the law. And Jesus uh, begins to teach, and they are what? They are astonished at his teaching. Now, this word for astonished doesn't necessarily mean to be uh, impressed with, though it does, it's not any less than that. It doesn't, to think, it doesn't mean to think highly of, though that would be included, but when, they, when Mark says that they were astonished by Jesus' teaching, they were overwhelmed. They were in shock. They were taken back by his teaching. And they say he teaches as one with authority and not like the scribes. See, the scribes, they would teach in a way that there would be uh, dialogue. They would talk back and forth, say, what do you think of this? And, and they would talk and they would debate and they would probably say, there is this one aspect you need to realize about this prophet. And if you realize this, you would understand what I'm saying. And they would go back and forth. But there was no real authority except when Jesus comes in. He comes into the presence of these religious men and they are shocked by his teaching. So he teaches with one, as one with authority. They, he teaches as if he is a king as if he is a prophet. If you remember, if you read through the Old Testament, we see that when, when kings speak, people listen. And when prophets speak, they spoke as the mouthpiece of God. So they spoke with the authority of God on high. So now Jesus, this very God in the flesh, comes in and he speaks with the authority of a king. He speaks with the authority of a prophet. So he does this with power, and they are, they are astonished. They are taken back. They are overwhelmed. They don't know what to do. They are impressed. And the primary emphasis of Jesus' authority in his teaching is that he did not try to open anything up for debate. He did not try to convince them. There was no dialogue necessarily going back and forth. He spoke with authority. He told them how it is. So we read all of this, and for me, I'm like, well, what did he say? What did he say? Now, if we are in Matthew, uh, Matthew lays out a lot of Jesus' sermons, his teachings, what Jesus actually said. Mark doesn't do that for us. It just says he spoke with authority. He spoke as one, uh, as, as if he had uh, complete authority over the Scriptures and over the people. So what did he say? This is one of those instances, if I could go back in time with a voice recorder and my laptop and take notes and try to say, I want to know what this sermon was all about that caused these people to be overwhelmed, to be astonished. And no doubt, Mark is, is explaining this um, and leaving out the details, leaving out the content on purpose, because this is what Mark does, right? Mark is not so much interested in telling us what Jesus said with authority. Rather, he wants to show us that Jesus has authority. He's not so much interested in, in talking about the, the three points of his sermon. Rather, uh, he wants to say, this king, this God, this Jesus that walked into your presence, he has authority, and I want to show you, not tell you, why he has authority. But first of all, when, when we think of it and we think about this authority, we have to keep it in the context of Jesus' kingship, that he is indeed the king. And uh, if we go through the, the gospel of Mark alone, we will see that Jesus is king over creation, right? He, he walked on the water, thus showing himself the one, as Job says, who tramples upon the waters, God himself. He's the king of peace when he calmed the storm. He is the king over sickness when he heals the, the blind, the deaf, the mute, the crippled. With the, the woman with the issue of blood, he, he is able to bring healing to those who are sick. Jesus himself is king over life and death when he raises Jairus' daughter from the dead. And obviously at the end, Jesus himself is raised from the dead. We see that Jesus is the king of glory in the transformation, in the transfiguration, when he's on the mountain and the glory of God comes upon him. Mark wants us to see that Jesus' kingship is cosmic. He is king over everything. Everything. So when he walks in to the synagogue, he walks in as king of the universe in Mark's mind. But he's not just the king over the universe. He's also the king of the covenant. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of God's people. He is the true son of David. In chapter 10, blind Bartimaeus, and we'll get to that in the months to come, but blind Bartimaeus wanting to be healed, what does he say? He calls out son of David. 
have mercy on me. So Mark is even telling us in that story, Jesus is the new and greater David. Now King David, he is the the king par excellence in the Old Testament, the greatest king that we have. He is uh, the, the king that God calls a man after his own heart. He is the model king who fights for his people. David is the king that slays Goliath, a a Satan-like figure in the Old Testament. David is the king who wrote the Psalms, the very songbook of Jesus. David is the one who loved the people and ruled with justice. David is the greatest king in the Old Testament, the humble warrior who feared God. And the promise given to David was that his kingdom would be an everlasting kingdom, that his throne would would never depart, but it would be established forever. So when the the Jews are hearing that this this Jesus is coming onto the scene and saying the kingdom of God is here, they are thinking in terms of a physical kingdom, that this is the new David, the warrior king, the one who's going to come and free us from the Romans, much like David freed them from the Philistines. This is what they're expecting. This is what they want. And it is with this authority that Jesus teaches as a king. So after announcing his kingdom in verse 15 and calling his disciples, he walks in to the synagogue and teaches as a king. He teaches with one, as one with authority. So again, it can be almost discouraging to say we don't know what it was that he taught. But again, Jesus wants to, or Mark wants us to, wants to show us Jesus' authority rather than tell us about it. So Mark wants to show us that Jesus is truly the king. And he wants to show us the king's power, which is what he moves to in verses 23 through 28. Instead of telling us what he said, he shows us this power, this authority. So 23 through 28 says, And immediately... There was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once, his fame spread everywhere throughout all the regions, surrounding regions of Galilee. So here, Mark shows us what it looks like for Jesus to have the king's authority. So Jesus is teaching in the synagogue, and as he's doing so, a man comes up to him with a demon inside of him, an unclean spirit, possessed. And notice that this demon is the one who speaks through this human being, this this person, this one created in the image of God has been possessed by this demon. And the demon cries out and says to Jesus, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Now, a couple things kind of come to our mind when we think about this. Why would there be a demon-possessed man in a house of worship? How could a demon-possessed man stand hearing about the king that's coming? about the prophets and the law. How could he do this unless there was no authority found in this synagogue? He was very comfortable there, except for when Jesus walks in. And it's interesting in the Gospel of Mark that when Jesus comes into uh, the same realm as demons or evil spirits, they go to him. They go to him. Why? Because he is their king. He is the one that has all authority, and this demon recognizes that. He's not allowed to go away. He has to come to Jesus. And he says to him, what have you to do with us? He doesn't say this to the religious leaders, to the pastors or the scholars of the day. He's not not concerned about the Spirit of God in these people. But when Jesus comes, he says, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? See, Mark is is telling us that Jesus taught with authority, and now this demon says, what have you to do with us? And that this demon, speaking in the plural, is not only talking about himself because it's a a singular demon in this story, but he's he's talking on behalf of the entire demonic realm. He says, what have you to do with us? Have you come to destroy us? 
Now, the, the demon understands who has the power here. And he's fearful and he comes and says, what are you going to do with us? Have you come to get rid of us? And Jesus is standing there. And he, he answers the man, or answers the demon after the demon acknowledges, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Mark talks about uh, the Holy One of God in reference and in contrast to the unclean spirit. You have an unclean spirit in this man, and this unclean spirit comes in contact with Jesus, and what is the contrast except for the unclean and the holy one of God? The one with authority, the one who, has, uh, who, who sits on the throne, the one with all power. And he says, have you come to destroy us? So what would the answer to this be? Has he come to destroy the demonic realm. Well, Mark actually helps us understand this in chapter 3, verses 22 through 27, with another uh, accusation that Jesus himself is possessed by a demon. And it says, And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons he cast out demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house is not able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself, he is divided. He cannot stand. But is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed, he may plunder his house. So when the, sa- when the demon says, have you come to destroy us? The answer is yes, but I've not only come to destroy you, I've came- come to plunder your house. I've come to take all of it. The entire world that you have uh, authority over is no longer yours. It's going to be mine. So what does he do? He, he casts out the demon. And the, the, the demonic realm is now shaking in their boots because the true king, the true authority has come. The demonic realm will no longer have authority over the nations, as Revelation 20 says. They will no longer be able to stop the spread of the gospel. They will no longer be able to contain the kingdom of God from advancing. So yes, Jesus has come with authority to destroy and to plunder the world for his glory. So Jesus says to him in Mark 1, 25 and 26, he says, but Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit did not like this. He started convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice. And then he came out. So by the words of the king, the demon fled. The demon was cast out. There was no real battle here. There's no question of, who had true authority, who really sits on the throne. These are the words of authority that people in the synagogue were astonished by. Right? So Mark, again, going back to the teaching, he doesn't tell us what Jesus said. He demonstrates it. That this power that has control over the world that we see throughout the Old Testament, that the demonic realm has authority given to them, over the nations of the world, now Jesus comes onto the scene and he robs them of their power. He disinherits them of their claim. These are the words of authority. And so Mark illustrates this for us so that we can see and watch Jesus' authority rather than just listen and hear it explained. And this is why Mark is an enjoyable book, right, to read through, is we see so much action and we see so so much illustration in life, in the life of Jesus, to back up what he's saying. So Mark says again how the people were amazed by his teaching with authority. They saw Jesus, by the words of his mouth, cast out a demon. And they were amazed. They were astonished. They say, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. This kind of sounds like uh, the, a similar thing that the disciples said when Jesus is on the boat and the storm is coming and they're freaking out and they think they're going to die and Jesus is asleep and they go down and wake him up 
And Jesus comes up and he tells the sea to be quiet, to shut up, to shut itself up. And immediately there was a great calm. And what do his disciples say? Who is this that even the wind and the seas obey him? And now the, the people in the synagogue are saying, who is this that even the demons obey him? Who is this? Who is this king? Who is this Jesus? That as the the creation falls into submission when he speaks, so does the demonic realm fall into submission when he speaks. This Jesus is still the one sitting on the throne. This Jesus is the one that still is speaking through his word to us. And it's amazing if we look at all that God has done in the Bible and we see creation's submission to the word of God. In creation, he spoke and everything came into existence, right? He tells the galaxies where to move and how to form, and they obey him. God tells the sun to rise in the east and set in the west, and it obeys him. God tells the wind to blow and the clouds to gather for rain, and they obey him. God tells the bear to hibernate and the geese to fly south, and they obey him. God tells the winds and the seas to be quiet, and they listen. And God tells the unclean spirits to depart, and they obey. Yet, when God calls us into submission, how do we respond? We say, no, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. See, Mark wants to push against this. He's saying, listen, do you realize who this Jesus is? Do you realize that this Jesus, who just called the the four disciples to be fishers of men, put a call on their life and has told them how to live, this same Jesus that has authority for all creation and authority over the demonic realm is now speaking to you? And how will you respond? We tell God that our actions, in our actions, that he is not king, rather, I'm king. I decide what I do. We tell God by our actions that my convenience is more important to me than his commands. We tell God uh, that our comfort is not to be disturbed. God, I'll, I'll do things for you, king, but don't, don't cause me to be uncomfortable. You know, I, I've worked hard for this life. I've worked hard for this comfort. And now, God, I, I don't want to disrupt that. So you can be king over this part of my life, but don't Don't affect my my comfort level because I've worked hard for this. You know, God tells us to advance his kingdom, to be fishers of men, to cast that net over our families, over relationships and jobs in the city. And we say, no, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be really a a fisher of men as you have called me to be. I I will throw a a hook into the the lake and see what happens. and And that's it. I'm not trying to to bring this net over my entire life and pull in all things to the glory and submission of the king. God tells us to be quick to repent, quick to forgive, be quick to reconcile, and we tell God we will do things on our own timeline. I'm not ready for that. God says, no, do this now. And may we, as a church, be people who are faithfully following our king. May we listen to our king and do what our king calls us to do. Like David's mighty men, when he spoke, they acted. And they had ears to hear. They were diligent. They were militant, thinking, waiting for the command of their king. And may we be like that for our king. May we go out this week and remember what Jesus has called us to do and be faithful followers and fall into submission to this king, both in our life and to our death. We are called to be a people who follow and obey Jesus. To do this, we must listen to what God's word calls us to do. These are not options for us, right? We are part of God's kingdom. He is the one on the throne. So when he says to love one another, to fight for one another, we ought to do that. We are to stand for what is right. We are to do justice and repent when we sin. We are to forgive one another. And that's huge, to forgive one another. How, how many of us, either right now, today, or in our lives, have gone months or years without truly forgiving, and it just destroys us on the inside. Bitterness sets in because we are not falling into submission to our king. When he says forgive, we are to forgive. We are to forgive one another. We are to encourage one another. 
We are to laugh together and cry together. We are to pray together. This is what we do as we follow our King. We are to baptize those who have come in. We are to take communion together and, and remind ourselves and as, as so many of the covenants in the Old Testament do, remind God of what He has done. That when we take the bread and we dip it into the, the juice or the wine, we are to remind God what he has done for us. He says, like the rainbow, when I look on this, I will remember the covenant that I made with you. Like he, he said in early in Exodus, when he heard the, the cries of Egypt, or of Israel, enslaved to Egypt, he goes, I remember my covenant with Abraham. And he acted. And then when we come with communion, he is saying, I remember what I have done for you. I remember the cross. I remember what, I, what uh, the, the atonement means. I remember the new covenant that I've made with you. And we, likewise, remember. We're to take communion together. We are to study his word together so we know who our king is. And we are not to neglect meeting together, as Hebrews says, has become the habit of some, but faithfully come together. And we're to sing together praises to our God. May we be a church that is serious and is known for our just all-out allegiance to our King. Amen? So we come to the last verse here, verse 28. And this verse is a, an interesting one. It says, And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. So when reading this story... It would flow much better into the next story if this verse were not here. It's clunky. It feels awkward. And, uh, I mean, listen to it. I mean, if I start in verse 27, it says, And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits. And they obey him. How much smoother would it be if it went right into, and immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John and goes on to another healing story. That's just a smooth transition. That's not what Mark did. He puts in this kind of strange verse that says, and at once his fame spread everywhere throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. So we, have to, we hear that and we say, okay, so he, he cast out a demon and he's about to go on, but first, Mark takes time to say, before he goes on, let me say this, his fame spread everywhere. So why is this? Why, why would Mark put this in here? Well, I, I think there's, there's a lot of excuses made for Mark at times, right? He's, he's the most least eloquent uh, gospel writer, which hopefully we have said that's absolutely not the case. Right? This book is full of symmetry and parallels and typologies and theologies. All this stuff that's just beautiful within the text on a literary level. So I don't think it's that Mark is a, a clumsy writer that he put this in here. Um, I, I don't think that Mark is lacking in any sort of uh, ability to convince people or to keep the narrative going. But Mark is doing something special. And what he's been doing is he has been creating a scene for us. Since his baptism, he's been creating a scene for us to recognize. He's creating a scene that links Jesus with King David in some very, very powerful ways. So I want to lay out this scene that Mark has been putting together for us to see why this verse is not at all clunky, but actually is absolutely beautiful and fitting perfectly in this passage. You know, in Bible study, we look, at, we look at words and we try to figure out what they mean and we look at phrases and understand how these words work together and we look at uh, paragraphs and we look at context and we try to understand what is the author communicating to us. But another thing that ancient writers and biblical authors will do will be to create scenes for us. And this is a collection of stories and verses or paragraphs that are put together in a particular way to remind the reader of another scene in the Bible that they would be familiar with. 
We see this all the time in movies, right? I was talking to uh, Zach this last week and said romantic comedies do this all the time, right? There's only a couple plots, but they change things just a little bit, and it reminds us of other movies we've seen or other plays and so on. So what Mark is doing in his brilliance of writing is creating for us a scene for us to recognize how Jesus' kingship is primary in this gospel and how we should think of Jesus as the one who comes after David, the one who will rule on that everlasting throne, that one who will be on the, uh, the throne of an eternal kingdom. This is what Mark wants us to understand. And this is the, the reason that the past few weeks we've talked so much about the kingdom of God is because this is what Mark wants us to take away from his gospel, that Jesus is the king. You know, Matthew sets out Jesus as the great uh, priest, a new Moses, a new teaching, a new law. Luke sets out Jesus as a great prophet who is ministering to those in exile. And Mark is setting out Jesus to be the great king, the new David, who is establishing his eternal throne. So as we read Mark, let's keep David in mind, even moving forward, uh, and know that Mark wants us to see Jesus as the new and better David. So this scene he has been creating starts actually back in verse 9 with Jesus' baptism and goes through verse 28. And we see that this, this scene parallels the life of David. <clears throat> so what Mark is doing is he is recreating in this chapter, in these verses, the first few chapters of David's anointed ministry. In 1 Samuel 16, we see that David is anointed by Samuel, a prophet, to be king. Saul started acting out. God says, I I'm no longer with Saul. Samuel, go and anoint a new king. He goes, Saul will kill me if I do that. He goes, go, I'll be with you. So Samuel goes, and he goes to Jesse, and he goes through all of David's older brothers. And finally, David comes, and he says, this is the one. This is the king. And he anoints David with oil. and says the Holy Spirit rushed upon him. Jesus finds his anointing for ministry, anointing as king at his baptism. He's baptized by a prophet. And what happens is the Spirit of God comes upon him. So we see that the anointings are very similar. The Spirit of God is present. You, they each have a prophet doing the anointing, both affirmed as king. Now, right after the anointing in David's life, and for Samuel 2 Samuel 16, uh, first, actually, I keep going back and forth. It's 1 Samuel. Uh, we see that a few verses later, Saul calls him into his chambers, into his throne room. And why is this? It's because David is about to do his first healing miracle as a king. Also, the first exorcism in the Bible. So we see Saul is tormented by an evil spirit. And David goes in and he plays his instruments and the spirit flees from Saul. Jesus, his first healing miracle is what we just went through. This exorcism that he goes into the synagogue, and he casts out the spirit, thus healing the man. So we see this anointings are paralleled with David and with Jesus, and we see that the first healing miracle is similar, the first exorcism in the Bible, and Jesus' first exorcism in Mark, both seeking to heal. And it goes beyond that. We see that uh, in, in 1 Samuel 17, David goes and fights Goliath a Satan-like figure in the Bible. Now, if you haven't heard of Goliath being a Satan-like figure, it's, it's, it's fascinating and it's, it's powerful. You know, the, the, the writer of Samuel, he, he explains Goliath as, as being this tall, mighty man with a shield and a spear, and it says that he has a, a coat of, of mail. So we think of chain mail, Right? But literally, if we were just to translate that, it would say, here's Goliath, this massive man coated in scales. It's scales. And then we say, well, that's weird. Why didn't he say armor or something like that? But the writer says scales. 
So if we were to look up, where else does this word show up? It only shows up in two other contexts. One, a couple of times referring to fish and, hey, what you should and should not eat. And then it refers to the dragon in Ezekiel 29, saying he has scales upon him. And then this dragon is picked up by John in Revelation and refers to this dragon of Ezekiel 29 12 different times as being Satan. So you have Goliath connected to the dragon in Ezekiel, and the dragon in Ezekiel connected to Satan in Revelation, which he says is the, that, that old serpent, the devil, who was in the garden, who tempted Adam and Eve. And what is the promise? That his head would be crushed, right? That the, the seed of the woman would come and he would crush the serpent's head. And what does David do once he slays this Satan-like figure, this dragon figure? He cuts off his head. So we see not only that, Goliath is a Satan-like figure, but, Jesus, uh, but David goes out to fight him as a solo champion, right? It wasn't the nation of Israel going up against the Philistines. It was David saying, I'm going to go on behalf of the Israelites, on behalf of the people of God, and I will fight this enemy. And we see in Jesus' life, right after his baptism, what does he do? He goes into the wilderness to do battle with Satan. And he goes by himself. He goes as our solo champion and defeats Satan in the temptation. In the same way that Satan defeated Adam, Jesus now defeats Satan. So we have these parallels going on in this scene that Mark is creating. And what we see after David kills this Satan-like figure in Goliath, that Saul is really impressed with him. And we see that Saul ends up sending him out to war and to continue to battle the Philistines. And, Satan, uh, and David begins to gain some popularity. And in 1 Samuel 18, it says that they came back from, from a battle in 18, 6 and 7. I'll just read it. It says, As they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistines, the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated, Saul has struck down his thousands, but then David his ten thousands. So here we see David's fame spreading through all of Israel. So now let's go back to that clunky verse in our passage in Mark. And what does it say? After he exercises the demon... People understand that he has authority. And what does Mark say? And at once his fame spread throughout all the surrounding regions of Galilee. So Mark is saying, uh, uh, Mark is creating for us a scene to say that Jesus is the new and better David. Jesus is the king that is to sit on the throne that was promised to David. So when we think about the story of David and Goliath, how often do we say, um, man, I want to identify not with Goliath, but with David, right? And we, we hear sermons in Sunday school lessons about how we can, as faithful followers of God, slay our giants. Be like David. Destroy the giants. But if we were to look at it from Mark's perspective and what he just did here in creating these scenes, who are we in the David and Goliath story? We're the Israelites cowering behind him. Say, we need someone to go and fight for us. Because I don't want to do it. I can't do it. He's killed so many of us already. I can't go and fight this man. Who are we in this story? We are not the hero. And Mark is trying to say, listen, you're not the hero in the Jesus story either. You're not Jesus. You're not the one that's going to be winning uh, and casting out demons apart from him. He does not say that uh, the disciples' fame spread throughout all the land. But how often do we kind of have that desire, right? That I want my name, my reputation to be well known throughout the land. I want to be known in Wichita or in my hometown. Now, Jesus is king. Jesus is the one that sits on the throne. It is Jesus' fame that goes out. And we are the ones who are to spread that word. That's our role in this story. Right? We are to be witnesses. We are to testify about this king who speaks with authority. We are the fishermen who cast our nets 
over life and culture and hoping that Jesus will bring in uh, all sorts of people and families and schools and systems and businesses and government to come into submission to himself. We are not the ones that, that gain fame. We are not the ones that are to make a name for ourselves. We are to, as David's mighty men obey David, uh, we are to obey our king. And we are to fall into complete submission to who he is. The same king that can cast out demons, that creates and calms storms. This is our God. This is the one that we follow. Let's pray.